Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 94 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the works of writer, director, producer J.J. Abrams and his extended Bad Robot universe. I'm your co-host, Matt Crandall, here as always with Marcelo Inestroza as we continue our rewatch of Fringe Season 2. Today we are talking about episode 10 and episode kind of 11 of the second season of Fringe. First up is episode 10, Grey Matters, which aired December 10th, 2009. It was written by Zach Stentz and Ashley Edward Miller. It was directed by the director of Jaws 2, Jenote Swarks, who also directed a lot of episodes of Smallville, so I think this guy was kicking around Vancouver. Marcelo, are there any memories you want to have extracted from your brain and put into a jar? Oh, Matt, you have no idea how many memories I want accessed. I want access from my brain and put it to a jar for so, so that maybe later on they can get, you know, put back in for whatever reason. The thing that I love about this episode is it addresses an issue that I've sort of been hinting at for weeks, weeks, podcasts on end about Walter's memory and the whole reason why his memory is so Fakakta. It's, it's it's like it's like playing a game of roulette, right? One day he'll remember something, and the next day he won't. So in this episode, it turns out that there's this guy that is taking out pieces of people's brains for a specific reason, and that reason, the pieces of brain that he's taking out of these specific people, are memories of Walter Bishop, and this guy. Uh, this doctor, Dr. Nolan, ends up uh, tracking down Walter and basically uh, connecting those pieces of Walter's brain to his current memory to make him tell him how he opened up a door to the other side. That's the basic gist of this episode. And I loved every single second of it. Why? Because like I just said, this episode confirms that the reason Walter is the way he is is because pieces of his brain were missing. And the kicker is when we find out who removed the pieces of Walter's brain, I, I, just, I, I just was clapping way back when I watched this episode for the first time. And today when I rewatched it for this conversation, I love this episode for so many reasons. It was so good. Yeah, it was definitely a really great one, and it was a mythology-based episode that helped explain why Walter has some of these holes in his memory in a way that was really interesting, and the specific memories that they removed being the way to open the door between worlds or whatever it is was really interesting, and I like that they are into this because the shape-shifting dudes were trying to extract these memories from other people and, and piece the thing together for their nefarious plot. So we meet up with them as they're doing this, and then Team Fringe gets involved and starts researching this mysterious Dr. Paris who has done this to a few people. There We find out there are a couple of patients. As we go, that kicker at the end is we find out that Dr. Paris is actually William Bell, and he has done this to Walter, and Walter was down for it, like it was, you know, Walter was all on board to make sure that this information would be quote-unquote safe, but we know that, you know, the shapeshifters are doing everything in their power to to further their war, that they're, they're fighting, that we're still trying to get a clearer picture of, and all of this stems back from, you know, the last time we caught up with them was when they were looking for that cryogenically frozen head of their leader and now we're finding more of their plan where they have to figure out how they can do what they need to do and it turns out that Walter was the guy who had a lot of that information in his head. I really liked that John Noble got to play a wide range in this episode because there are a few moments when he is being interrogated that he becomes very lucid and very mean and it's like smooth talking, like, you think you're smarter than me. You don't know jack shit, Walter. And it was like, whoa, where did this guy come from? What are you thinking when we get that moment where Walter goes from, like, you know, this bumbling, lovely old man that we kind of know who's a little bit confused and has holes in his memory to that one scene where he is like an entirely different Walter for a quick stretch? I really, you know, that kind of terrified me because I'm like, okay. 
if this was Walter at his full strength, what kind of an individual was he? What kind of a monster was he? And I'm like, okay, this version of Walter, I could see doing much worse things than Walter at half strength, per se. So I was terrified. But but like you said, the way that Walter played that, going from personality to personality, was just really, really great. And John Noble, he played that so perfectly because one moment he would be the Walter that you, I, and a lot of people love, but the next minute a switch would turn on and he would be that Walter that was a Walter that was cocky, was confident. The one thing that I also loved about this episode is that you brought it up. I completely forgot about it. A couple episodes back, the shape shifters were looking for this for the specific head, right? The the head of their leader, as you said. And in this episode, that that head is attached to a body, and that body belongs to the guy that removes all these pieces from these other individuals. That makes them mad. So I really, really like that aspect of this episode. Uh, The other thing that I love about this episode is when Walter gets kidnapped by this doctor and the, the shapeshifters, Peter is panicked. He is beyond worried. And I really like Joshua Jackson's performance in these specific scenes because as the series has gone on, we've seen their two characters develop a love and respect for each other. And this episode is where it's really shown off. We really understand that Peter is beginning to get a type of relationship with Walter that he didn't have before. I just love the way that Joshua Jackson played it. Yeah, Josh Jackson is great in this episode, especially because he gets to play that worry and that alarm. And especially when in the last act of the episode, after you know, the head of the shapeshifters has his run in with Walter and he's trying to make his quick escape. He gets stopped by Olivia and Olivia finds out that he has dosed Walter and Olivia has to choose between capturing him or saving Walter. And when she talks to Peter on the phone, the panic, the concern, the alarm, Josh Jackson really sells that and makes it feel like the life and death situation that we are presented that it is supposed to be because it's some lethal neurotoxin that you need to give a special red, green, and blue antidote in the right order, or you make it worse. Josh Jackson killed it in this episode. And then it was really interesting at the end where Olivia makes the choice to save Walter. She does kill a bunch of the shapeshifting team. Roger Cross, uh, who was on the X-Files and was Curtis on 24, has been one of the shapeshifters and he gets killed in this episode. But shout out to him. I think he was kicking around Vancouver. I like that she does choose to save Walter, but then the lead shapeshifter dude's like, now I know you are weak. Now I know that you won't do the big things if it means small sacrifices. So his cause, the way they view this universe shattering war that's coming, he knows that one life doesn't matter. It's about all life. So that moment makes us recontextualize the actions and whether Olivia actually did the right thing or not. Obviously for the fun show we like to watch with Kooky Walter, she did the right thing. But in terms of the war between two worlds, did she do the wrong thing? And again, we mentioned it on the last episode in that observer centric episode, they said, Oh, she's got so much suffering that's coming up. And it's like, okay, we know that she's got suffering coming up. This guy is addressing how weak she he thinks she is. People are really shitting on Olivia a little bit over and over again. So I hope that we get some good wins, but it was nice that she got to save the day. Walter was saved after this traumatic event. But we now know that, you know, Walter, when he did turn and he was very lucid, was scary. And he felt like a William Bell, two-faced, evil scientist, a lot more sinister than we have been clocking him as lately so i thought that was interesting going forward knowing that he went to these great lengths to hide this information it's starting to really color our view of walter and i wonder you know are we gonna feel the same about this guy by the end of this season as we do in this first half of the year i think that's a great question because we've always felt a specific way about walter we we really love the kooky kind i pissed my pants walter but we have to understand that this guy 
is capable of so many awful things that he he looks kind and he looks you know like like he couldn't hurt a fly with his amazing sweaters and his milkshakes Th- this guy's appearance is very very deceiving and it really freaked me out when he was captured and the shapeshifter guys made his brain you know access different parts of his brain that led to him acting you know you know in proper walter mode so i'm very very interested to see if Walter gets access to these pieces of his brain again. What is he going to be capable of, you know? And the other thing that I was thinking at the end of this episode is Olivia is presented with that choice by the the the, the head individual of the shapeshifters, the doctor, right? And I'm like, okay, Olivia chose to save Walter this time, but if she's presented with a similar situation like that again, do you think that she would make the difficult choice? Even if that choice led to her losing someone who she loved? It makes you wonder, especially because the guy says to her, now I know you are weak. I think that she will now think, okay, if she has to make that kind of choice again, if the enemy views that as weakness, will she then make the choice that they would view as strength to try and get one over on them? So it does make us wonder, if this happens three episodes from now, would it be the same outcome? will be interesting to see how they decide to play it out because this episode furthered the mythology. It made Walter seem a little less sunshine and roses than he has in the past. It showed us how serious these shapeshifters are in their mission and their resolve that they're willing to do just about anything to get it done, even if it means digging into people's brains and removing pieces of Walter's brains that were hidden like these crazy extremes, and I don't know that Olivia's willing to go to those extremes yet. So it really added a lot to our overall concept of what's going on, and it showed Belle as an accomplice to this whole thing in a a different light. So I think it really amped up some of the stakes while being a fairly low-key, for the first half, like a low-key, fun, you know, fringy kind of episode, but having a lot of that mythology baked in. And some fun dialogue. So I think very strong episode. This was like the the last episode before the new year. So this was kind of before the Christmas break. We'll send you off with a really nice mythology heavy episode. That still doesn't address shimmering Peter. Or Walter kidnapping his son. But gives us enough that in the new year we would be super psyched to to join the team again. I got to think, Matt, I got to think that's coming because that's the oh, that is like that is like the anvil that you and I have been waiting to land on Walter's head. So it's got to come at some point. The other question that I have, do you think that William Bell is responsible for these shapeshifters activities on our side? Do you think that he is fully aware what these people are doing? It does make you wonder how much can we trust William Bell? Actually, he's kind of playing both sides and having a hand in everything that's happening. So that definitely is something that I think is hidden in the back of our brains and hopefully doesn't have to be removed because maybe that will come to fruition in some way, shape, or form. Now, after all that fun mythology, we get the ultimate episode of the week because in season one of Fringe, They produced 21 episodes of television, but Fox only aired 20 episodes. One of those episodes that they produced that didn't air was called Unearthed. And in January of 2010, Fox decided this will be the one that we show first back in the new year. They put it on a different night. So they aired it on a Monday, I think, which was not Fringe's normal night. And they made it like sort of like a a bonus episode event. It was the first episode of the new year. And they did not tell people like you are about to watch the episodes called Unearthed. And it literally was unearthed from like the Fox vault to be thrown on TV. So they didn't give anybody any context for it. So it is a standalone mystery of the week episode. But because it was filmed back in New York in season one. It features Charlie Francis as if nothing has ever happened and Charlie hasn't become a shapeshifter and been killed. To make matters even more confusing, it aired as this spot, episode 11 of season 2. On streaming, it is presented as episode 21 of season 1. And on the Blu-ray and DVD collection, 
it's on the season two Blu-ray as a bonus feature on the last disc. So right now, after all of that preamble to just set up what the hell this episode even is, Marcella, what did you think of Unearthed, the unaired lost episode of Fringe that Fox decided to just throw on on a random night with no explanation? This episode was like a true Fringe event in itself because the team at Fringe made this episode. They looked at it and they were like, we don't like this episode. We just want to throw it out. So they gave it to the Fox people and the Fox people were like, holy shit, we need an episode to start off to start off our new year lineup do you, and and for some reason they came to the people at fringe and they were like they were like do you guys have an episode that we could just throw in there that you really don't care about and the fringe team gave them this episode and they said here do this but it doesn't match up because like you said charlie's back from the dead so you're like wait a minute i thought he was dead what the hell what the hell is happening here so it was very very disorienting look i love the actor who plays charlie i think he's great so it was really, really nice to see him again, but it was really, really disorienting to, for me to watch this episode because I know that this episode doesn't really fit in the fringe continuity. It doesn't fit at all because it was it was like an episode that should have happened way earlier back in season one. But uh, with all those thoughts out of the way that have nothing to do with the episode, I really like this episode because it starts off, it starts out with a uh, mother saying goodbye to her daughter, who is in a coma for some reason. And ever ever since my grandmother passed away, she actually had a, a, a heart attack a, a while back. And we ended up putting her on life support for a couple days. And then we decided to let her go because there was no way that her quality of life would amount to nothing if we were ever hooked up to the machines all the time. So watching this opening sequence of this young woman being taken off a of life support really, really touched my heart and it brought back so many painful memories, but in a good way, because if uh, entertainment can remind you of happy times and painful times in your life, it can serve as a positive experience. So while I was watching this episode, just on the opening, I was like, I think I'm going to like this episode. After the young woman is taken off of life support, the young woman is slated for organ donation. So they take her into the OR and they start to open her up to take all the organs out. And all of a sudden, she wakes up. And in true fringe fashion, when she wakes up, she starts, you know, reciting these numbers. And these numbers turn out to be specific locations of United States military bases and hidden missiles that nobody is supposed to know about. So just on that by itself, I was like, this is interesting. I, I really, really like the opening to this episode for the personal reasons and for the for, for the fringeness of it. It is an obviously an entirely standalone episode that they thought was so standalone they could just throw it in the garbage if they wanted or they could throw it on TV and we would be fine. But it is actually a really easy to follow and interesting fringe concept that often happens in like a lot of movies where it's not quite a a full body swap it's not certainly not a body swap comedy. It's not a full Freaky Friday, but there have been movies where, you know, people die and something happens with their consciousness at the exact moment of death. So I like that this starts with that young girl, Lisa, and we do see that she gets taken off the life support, but then comes screaming back to life. And I was disappointed that the number she was saying was six, eight, three, three, whatever, and not four, eight, 15, 16, 23, 42. Cause I'm like, that's right there. Just do it. Give it to me. So I like that. we then find out she died at the same moment that this military guy, Rusk was murdered and that it is his consciousness that has basically possessed this girl and the way that they frame it. So obviously it is a scientific thing. And as Walter digs into the case, he thinks that it was this heavy radiation that got Rusk's energy to be able to do this. But we involve the church and a priest and we start talking about how maybe this is actually more like an exorcist kind of moment and some sort of religious supernatural, not just of a fringe event. So I thought that was kind of a cool angle to take, but it got me thinking because this was 
a much more religious centric plot than fringe normally does that was the only like thing that i was like maybe that was the trigger but also maybe not maybe they just made too many episodes of tv that first season but i like this because it was low key it felt like a low stakes episode but it was interesting and it was simple concept having this young girl be this military dude sometimes was kind of was kind of cool you mentioned that maybe the reason why the good people at fox didn't air this episode when they were supposed to was because of the religious undertones of this whole episode i not being a religious person at all really enjoyed seeing the science aspect of this episode clash with the religious aspect of this episode my favorite scene is when the young girl's mother is at wit's end right and walter says why don't you just take her to my lab and i'll see if i could do something and this woman's priest from her parish is right there and he goes are you crazy are you you're not going to trust this crazy whacked out man with your daughter modern science has failed her so we just have to basically let her go. I mean, he didn't really say that, but he definitely implied that. And I love the moment when Walter just lets this poor priest guy have it. He starts, you know, basically reciting everything bad about the Catholic Church. But even if you're a diehard Catholic, you understand that the Catholic Church has skeletons all over the place. So I really loved that Walter, in a way, used the Catholic religion to his advantage to get the opportunity to help out this young girl. Also, I really loved the performance of the young girl who who is being possessed by this agent. When she is possessed by the agent, she uses this really, really manly, raspy voice thing. It's it's so cool. I mean, to be honest, going into this episode... I didn't think I was going to enjoy it this much because of all the all the all the hoopla that you and I had to figure out where where, where the hell we were going to fit this episode. But I really enjoyed it because of these reasons. And another thing that I enjoyed at the very end, once Walter figures out a way to remove the, the, the consciousness of this guy who got murdered from the young woman, he uh, when 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 she's leaving she says something to Olivia. He, she goes, I turn 18 in like six months, so you better make your move. I really enjoyed that moment. Yeah, so as this whole thing is going on with the young girl, Lisa, she's kind of swooning over Peter. And so then she does give Olivia that really, really funny, but also like, oh my God, moment at the end where she says, yeah, you better make your move because I turn 18 and I'm going to go after this guy. So Olivia knows that this guy, Girl's got a crush on Peter, which I thought was really funny. And I do like that the main through line as they start to realize that this guy has possessed this girl is that part of his unfinished business. You know, we always talk about possession and unfinished business before they can move on is that he has to murder his wife. And so this 17 year old girl, when she's taken over, it becomes this revenge drama where You know, she's going to go John Wick on Rusk's wife because his wife had him killed. So I like that we take kind of like this tried and tested and true body swap possession kind of thing. And we also add the revenge, the revenge killing aspect to it, which I love a good revenge plot. So that was really interesting. And then the stinger of this episode, after they think that they have purged the consciousness and saved the day, we see somewhere else another dead body wakes up and begins speaking Russian. So it's got that kind of Twilight Zone-esque feel where we think we've saved the day, the girl is safe, everything is great, but no, this continues on. And it kind of reminded me, not a great movie, but the Denzel Washington movie Fallen from the late 90s, where he starts off in the opening narration is, let me tell you about the time I almost died. And we think that it's good guy Denzel telling the story. And spoiler alert for a movie that came out 30 years ago. Then we find out it's actually he's narrating the movie as the demon that Denzel was trying to kill because he then possesses Denzel at the end and the cycle continues on. And so I thought that this had shades of that movie where we think we have gotten rid of the demon, but it actually has just moved on somewhere else for a standalone episode of fringe quite fun very interesting 
But seeing Charlie again after he had been dead for a couple episodes was jarring. And it really makes me wonder, why didn't they just schedule a double shot of Fringe in season one or throw this on in the summer in between seasons? So the scheduling of Unearthed is kind of the weirdest part of the whole thing. But as a standalone episode of Fringe, it's not bad. The only thing I didn't quite understand is how this agent ended up getting into this young woman's consciousness because they do mention that he was on a some sort of a boat and on that boat there was radiation and because of that radiation that allowed his essence to leave his body once he was dead and go into the body of someone else but i'm like okay if he died on this boat how did he go from dying on the boat to ending up in the body of a 70 year old girl who just had an accident in gym class. How does that happen? But but then again, you guys are probably screaming at me right now. Marcelo, you're watching Fringe. Shut up. Stop trying to make sense out of this. It, it's, it's not important. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is you mentioned this episode has a sort of Twilight Zone ending to it where, as you said, we think the day is won. We think the spirit of this agent is gone. But lo and behold, this guy has his car accident. We think he's dead. And then he comes back to life. The other thing that, that, I, that I thought that was very reminiscent of is the X-Files. Listen, I adore the X-Files. I want to believe, right? But the one thing I hated about the X-Files from day one is that every case that Scully and Mulder worked on, every one of them, was a, every episode that Chris Carter, Frank Spotnitz ever wrote, it was open-ended. Nothing in that show was ever resolved. So this, the ending of this episode gave me post-traumatic stress from watching The X-Files back in the day. What do you think about that, man? I definitely see that. And this definitely feels like a very X-Files-esque episode and does have that open-ended, things can go on ending. So I definitely think you are right to call that out because heavily influenced by all those X-Files tropes. A fun, weird nugget of an episode, unearthed, was unearthed and just given to us. So that's that. Next week, we will be back to the main through line of season two, talking about episodes 11 and 12. So that is the homework for next week. If you guys are following along, we want to give a shout out to Nell Tom a listener who posted on a fringe fan Facebook page about our podcast and said that they have never been a podcast person, but they are now totally hooked. They feel like they should have a lab listen chat group for it. And we want to say thank you very much for listening. Everybody who listens, we appreciate all of you and any engagement comments we get, we will let you know on here. And certainly if you're enjoying the show, please follow, like subscribe, tell your friends Every little bit helps. If you want to get in touch with me personally, I am on Twitter at Matt Crandall. Marcelo, Twitter is a good spot to reach out to you. How can they do that? I'm at, I'm on Twitter at CreekFanatic88. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Until next week, Radio 815, over and out. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.